This talk is one of a series of lectures on the zermelo frankel axioms for set theory and will be about the axiom of infinity. So the axiom of infinity just says there exists an infinite set. Well, it, that's informally what it says. The trouble is um, the term infinite is a little bit unclear because the language of set theory doesn't actually contain the word infinite in it. You have to sort of write everything in terms of the, 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 the membership relation and the usual symbols of first order logic. So um, how can you say there is an infinite set? Well, you could say there exists um, a set 0, 1, 2, and so on of um, integers greater than or equal to 0. Well, again, this runs into the same problem that you know, set theory doesn't know what an integer actually is until you tell it. So we've got to define what an integer is. So let's call this set S. Well, we might say the set S, let's say it contains zero. Well, what is zero? Well, well, let's just write zero as the empty set. So it contains the empty set. And then we also want to say if it contains an integer, it contains that integer plus one. Well, what do we mean by plus one? Um, well, one way of encoding the integers is to say zero is the empty set. One is the set just containing zero. Two is the set just containing zero, one. Three is the set just containing zero, one, two, and so on. So in general, n plus one is the set n union, um, the, the one element set with n in it. Um, that's not the only way of encoding the integers. We could say zero is the empty set, one is the set containing zero, two is the set just containing one, and in general, n plus one is the set just containing n. And it doesn't really matter which of these methods you use. Um, in the early days of set theory, people quite often used the second method because it's a little bit simpler. Um, turns out the first method is a bit more convenient. Um, first, it means the number n is a set containing exactly n elements, which is kind of convenient. And secondly, this method also works for infinite ordinals. You can um, define every ordinal to be the set of ordinals less than it. And, and that, that, that still works for infinite ones. So um, there are at least two obvious ways of defining the axiom of infinity. You say there's a set that contains the empty set and is closed under whatever operation you were encoding addition of one with. Um, so next we can ask, is the axiom of infinity needed? So, um, in other words, what happens if you drop the axiom of infinity? And there's one point at which you need it. If you're looking at the, inf uh, the von Neumann hierarchy, you take the sets V0 is the empty set, V1 is the power set of V0, and so on. And you want to take the union of them um, to get a set V omega. Well, to take the union, um, you need to somehow form V0, V1, and so on into, into, into a set. So you want to form a set whose elements like that. And you can get this set if you apply the axiom of replacement to an infinite set, but you need an infinite set to start with. So, so um, the axiom of infinity is needed um, in order to, to take the union of all the um, V alpha for finite alpha. Um, um, and you can also ask what happens if you take the theory, zermelo frankel set theory, and remove the axiom of infinity and add an axiom saying infinity is actually false. So this means not. So I'm going to add an axiom saying there isn't an infinite set. So can we find models of this? Um, well, there are two obvious models and some non-obvious models. So I'll first do the two obvious models. The first really obvious model is the empty set. Um, so if you take the empty set, you can check that this satisfies all the axioms of set theory, except it doesn't satisfy the axiom of infinity. Obviously not because it doesn't have any sets at all, but you know, all the other axioms say if you've got a set then it has such and such properties or whatever. And if, you, if you've got no sets at all, then it vacuously satisfies all the axioms. Um, there's a problem with this. Um, um, is the empty set allowed 
to be a model. And um, the problem is, if you look at several books on model theory, look up the definition of a model, um, they sometimes will not allow the empty set to be a model of a theory. Um, th th this is part of a long historical tradition of being rather nervous about the empty set. So um, in the early days of set theory, people actually argued about whether the empty set should count as a set or not, and it was sometimes called the fictitious set. Now, I mean, I think that's a, that's a sort of problem. You think of a set as consisting of gathering together various objects, and it doesn't seem to make sense to gather together no objects at all. So people would sometimes think that the empty set shouldn't really be a set. And, and, and this sort of strange attitude, this sort of strange nervous attitude still exists in, in a lot of model theory. Um, there was actually a reason for this nervousness in model theory. Um, if you look at the rules of inference of first order logic, some of the older rules of inference will allow you to do things like if you know for all x, 5x is true, you're allowed to deduce that there exists an x such that 5x. Um, the trouble is this rule of inference assumes the universe that you're working in or your model is non-empty. Um, rather, obviously, if your universe is actually empty, then it's true that for all x, phi of x, but it's not true that there exists an x of phi of x. You know, if, if, if all unicorns have horns, you can't deduce there exists a unicorn with a horn. Um, so, um, if you want to allow the empty set to be a model of something, you need to slightly adjust the rules of inference for first order logic. And roughly speaking, what you have to do is to keep track of which types or universes um, are empty or non-empty. Um, in type theory, this actually becomes quite important because you can get lots of types which it's far from clear whether or not they're empty or not. For instance, you might have a type theory where, where one possible type is the is the type of counterexample to the Riemann hypothesis, and obviously it's a rather difficult problem to tell whether or not this type is empty or not. Um, so the empty set is a model of Zermelo-Frenkel set theory without infinity, provided you're willing to allow the empty set to be a model. Um, well, of course, the um, uh, slightly more serious model of Zermelo-Frenkel set theory minus infinity is, is the other uh, heredit Errorly finite sets. So what this means is the set is not only finite, but all its elements are also finite sets, and the elements of the elements of those are finite sets, and um, if you take the union of all that, then that's still finite. And these can be identified with finite rooted rigid trees. So you remember that any set can be thought of as a, a rooted rigid tree where its members are the things um, that the, the root connects to. So this would be a set whose two elements are the set corresponding to this tree and the set corresponding to this tree. Um, so um, th this is, of course, a model of zermelo frenkel set theory minus the axiom of infinity plus the axiom saying infinity is actually false. Um, there's a really neat way of encoding finite root rooted rigid trees found by Ackermann. We can encode these as non-negative integers. And the way you do this is you fix a non-negative integer, say 25, and you write it in binary. So that would be 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. And if you look at the binary positions of these, you see there's a 1 in positions 4, 3, and 0. So 25 is going to correspond to the set containing three elements, 4, 3, and 0. And similarly, 4 will be written in binary like that. So 4 is the set containing just one element, 2. And you can start off at the beginning. So 0 is just the empty set, and 1 is um, 2 to the 0. So it's a set just containing 0, and 2 is equal to 2 to the 1, so it's a set just containing 1, and 3 is equal to 2 to the 1 plus 2 to the 0, so it's a set containing um, 0 and 1, and so on. Um, by the way, um, the integer corresponding 
to a set can be surprisingly large. For example, suppose I take this rather harmless looking tree here. Let's just take a random looking tree, which doesn't look particularly exciting. And let's try and work out what integer encodes this. Well, um, we can sort of start at the bottom and work up. So these just correspond to zero. This corresponds to one. This corresponds to one. This one, um, the set corresponds to two to the zero plus two to the one, which is three. This corresponds to two to the three, which is eight. This corresponds to two to the eight, which is 256. And this suddenly corresponds to two to the 256 plus three. So this has suddenly become a really enormous integer with, you know, sort of, um, which would take about a minute or so to write out explicitly. So, so even quite small trees can be encoded by absolutely huge integers. Um, um, in, in fact, um, there are several computer languages that actually have a special operation that does this encoding. Uh, you, you can have a, an operation, um, you, you know, m is a member of n if, if the nth binary digit of n is 1. And various computer languages actually have this instruction in that. Um, uh, th 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 this gives us, um, you can also form a tree of all integers with a line connecting them if one of the integers is a member of another. And this, this, this actually gives you something called the random graph. So if you want to know what the, what the graph of inclusion relations between rooted trees is, it, it, it is in fact a well-known graph. Actually, strictly speaking, the random graph is an undirected graph, but graph of rooted trees is directed, but never mind. Um, so this encoding of um, hereditarily finite sets of rooted trees um, actually can be used to show that zermelo frenkel set theory minus infinity plus not infinity, I guess, is in some sense more or less equivalent to piano arithmetic. So you can encode piano arithmetic in, inside this theory here, and you can encode this theory here inside piano arithmetic because piano arithmetic can, can, can actually describe this relation you used for encoding trees as integers. Uh, we can also see that zermelo frenkel set theory implies the consistency of zermelo frenkel set theory without the axiom of infinity. So the axiom of infinity is necessary in a fairly strong sense. Um, of course, zermelo frenkel set theory can't prove the consistency of zermelo frenkel set theory plus infinity. Um, so, so removing infinite, the axiom of infinity definitely decreases the strength in the sense that there are some arithmetic statements that you can no longer prove. Um, so you remember we, we, we had this earlier that, that the axiom of union um, is like the axiom of infinity in that we, we can prove an analogous statement. On the other hand, the axiom of foundation was kind of rather weaker in that um, we were unable to prove this. Um, so next we can ask, are there other models of um, of zermelo frenkel set theory minus infinity plus the um, negation of the axiom of infinity? And the answer is yes, but they're all rather weird. They're all non-standard. And you can get these models as follows. You, you, what you can do is you can um, add a lot of new constants for integers, say c0, c1, c2, and you can add axioms saying c0 is equal to c1 plus 1, c1 is equal to c2 plus 1. Um, here I'd have to choose some way of encoding addition by 1 in set theory. I don't really care what it is. Um, so if you take um, this theory here with these extra constants, this is consistent um, by because any finite subset is consistent. Um, so it has a model by Gödel's completeness theorem. Um, but the trouble is this model now contains these rather weird objects like C0 because um, C0 is a sort of non-standard 
integer. It can't be a standard positive integer because you can subtract any finite number from it and you can subtract one any finite number of times and it's still a positive integer. So what we're getting is um, this is a non-well-founded model. And it's a bit weird because if you look at the number C0, it seems to be an infinite set. And we've got an axiom saying that all sets are finite, so how can we have an infinite set in this model? Well, whether or not it's an infinite set depends on whether you look at it from outside or inside the model. So it's internally finite, but from an external point of view, it's infinite. And the point is that whether or not something is infinite is, is it's not really an absolute concept. It kind of depends on which model something is in. Um, so if you look at one of the definitions for an infinite set, it says there should be um, an injective map from the set to a proper subset of itself. And so whether a set is finite or not depends on whether such a map exists. And it's possible to have a model um, such that the um, map from F, we might have a map an injective map from a set S to itself. And the problem is the, uh, the, the, this, this function might exist outside the model, but the model doesn't actually contain it. So someone living outside the model can see that the set is infinite because they can see this um, injective map to a proper subset. But someone living inside the model can't see this because the function doesn't actually exist inside the model. So as usual with non-standard models, very strange, freaky things happen. Um, the, the final way of viewing the um, axiom of infinity, you can think of it as being a sort of the first large cardinal axiom. So large cardinal axioms normally refer to very large cardinals way beyond the first uncountable and so on. But in some sense, this is just a historical accident. And the, the axiom of infinity is in some sense the most powerful large cardinal axiom of all because it's the first one to define an infinite cardinal. Okay, um, so that's enough about the axiom of infinity. Um, next lecture will be about the power set axiom, which is probably the strongest of all axioms of set theory.